transportation, because there are going to be some transportation savings in this, particularly in the urban areas. We work on connected networks of trails and developing trail segments that can be used uh, for active transportation to get from your house to a, uh, to a school or from your home to, to the local grocery store and, and back. And, and so fewer car rides, those lead to some transportation savings and then health, just the, the physical health benefits and the mental health benefits of more access to parks and open space and trails is very significant. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Gary Merritt with the Great Springs Project uh, that's happening right here in Central Texas, uh, basically between Austin and San Antonio. And uh, Gary really gives a great overview of this exciting project. It's gonna be nearly 100 miles in total, uh, connecting four of the most important uh, springs that exist naturally here in the Central Texas area area and uh, it's it's a lot of fun it's a beautiful concept and it's wonderful to see two things happening land being conserved and trail going down on the ground uh, without further ado let's get right to it with Gary Merritt uh, Gary it's such a wonderful uh, opportunity to have you on the podcast welcome well thank you John thanks for having me so, Gary, I, I love to have my guests just uh, introduce themselves, so I'll turn uh, the floor over to you. Uh, who is Gary Merritt? So, thanks, John. I'm Gary Merritt. I'm the CEO of Great Springs Project. Fantastic. And uh, wh where'd you grow up? I'm from a small town in the western hill country called Lakey. Okay. It's between Kerrville and Uvalde, right on the okay. edge of the Edwards Plateau. The Frio River is on one side of my county and the Nueces River is on the western side of my county. Some people may have been to Garner okay. State Park, it's 10 miles upstream from there, or okay. Lost Maple State Park, we're about 15 miles west of there. Wow, okay, cool. So it sounds like uh, the hill country is in your blood. It really is, yeah. My family's yeah. been in the hill country for generations. I grew up in a, that town of 500 people and, um, and just spent all my outdoor time, all my growing up time outside and traipsing around and um, have, have continued to right. the land to be a really important part of my life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, formal training, uh, what sort of background and education do you have? Yeah, for, after um, Lakey High School, I went to Rice University to do my undergrad, law school at University of Texas. Then I practiced law, corporate and real estate law for seven years in Houston and then moved back to my little hometown of Lakey to um, open a law practice there where I did a lot of real estate work, a lot of corporate work. And I also got involved in local government there being our elected county attorney for 10 years and our elected county judge for seven years. And that's Real County. So when did you start, you know, getting really interested in the, the concept of land conservation and, and, and how does that kind of tie maybe into your, your, like your personal life and how you like to, you know, get out, in the, in the wilderness. Yeah. You, you know, I said before that I've, I've, being on the land was important to me and, and it, yeah. it really was where um, I grew up in a, a small, small community um, with a lot of around me. Um, and, and so for us, that's what we did um, for fun. We went, we were outside and we were looking for swimming holes along the Frio river or the creeks. Um, you know, as kids, we would be on bikes or horses or on foot or whatever, just outside all the time. And so that, and, and all, all my family has worked on ranches, um, cutting cedar, driving trucks, working. And so being, being on, on the land is always something really important to me. Then working in real estate, you know, you sort of look at and learn how to look at land with a, a certain viewpoint. But then when I became county attorney and then county judge, one of the things we, we, I worked on was to do some long-term planning for the county. Mm -hmm. And in my county, Real County, our, our economy was driven by tourism. And so I was looking around and talking with folks and was thinking that natural resources there are our economic engine. That's our Toyota plant for San Antonio or the Samsung that's gonna be here um, just north of, of Austin. And so we started to build conservation resource protection into our our long-term planning. I mean, right. we, we needed to have the river be clean so people would come back year after year and have water in the river and have the air be clean and for people to see the cypress trees because that's how 
people make their living. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to pull up the website here. And again, the organization is the Great Springs Project. And the website here is greatsprings.org. Dot org and uh, it really it, it says right here you know it's the heart of of texas talk a little bit about what this project you know is and is about so great springs project is for me it's this it's the project of my lifetime it really pulls together everything that i'm i'm good at or and passionate about um from a, a, a texas perspective it really is a big texas sized project it has conservation at its core of protecting land over the recharge zone of the Edwards Aquifer between San Antonio and Austin and protecting these the four iconic springs that are in the, the Great Springs alignment. Uh, the San Antonio Springs, which is the Blue Hole at Incarnate Campus in San Antonio, to Comal Springs, downtown New Braunfels, to San Marcos Springs, and then on to Barton Springs in, in downtown Austin. And so this protecting and connecting these four springs and doing it from a market-based transactional perspective, it's just everything that I love to do. But there's this tension, there's this pressure of this is a desirable place. There is housing shortages and there's this pressure to try to uh, continue to, to build more housing and continue spreading further and further out. And yet, you know, we have to find that balance, right? This is over some of those crucial aquifers and recharge zones. Talk a little bit about that tension and how you all are, you know, relatively newcomers to the scene, helping to to try to manage that. Texas is a growing state. Our population is growing. Our economy is growing. And and so we do need um, more housing. We do need more places for people to, to work. Uh, and, and and to live, but we also need more places for people to be outside. And right. and I believe Great Springs Project. We believe that 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 we can find that balance. And those those two things that seemingly are attention can work together. For us, the the reason that we work in such a tight geographic area over the recharge zone of the Edwards Aquifer, slightly into the contributing zone between Austin and San Antonio, is where those springs are, and it's and it's within our mission to protect them. But it's also to bring attention to the place and what the recharge zone of an aquifer means and why it's important to be in, thoughtful and intentional about the way that we orient toward the land. And so with the same intentional, intentionality of, of developing single family houses or commercial space, we should have the same intentionality for the way that we treat for us, particularly the recharge areas of the aquifer and those and those four springs. So it's just bringing to people's mind that this is another thing that's really important that we need to be taking into consideration and actually working toward being successful at. We can be successful at adding more parks and open space and spring protection in this area as we're adding more houses and commercial. Yeah, yeah. And I pulled up this uh, slide that shows those uh, an overview of those four critical springs and their locations. And this is a 100 mile spring to spring to spring trail network that's in, in place. And, and to the point, I mean, it's it's right here in the description. It's a national park size corridor. This is massive. Who dreamt up this idea? What's the history of the, the, the vision of it? Yeah, yeah the vision um, comes from our board chairperson, Deborah Morin. Um, she is from San Antonio, lived in Austin to go to the University of Texas, and then had made Austin her home. And for many years, she has thought about and visualized how to protect the springs, and particularly the recharge features that support those springs. For her, it was the idea of being active in transactions to do it. And so, and they, and she, she with some friends, uh, started to work around. Uh, San Marcos Springs, especially a little under a decade ago, and they they worked to move some land into conservation there uh, to protect San Marcos Springs, and with with great success, along with other folks around San, in San Marcos, that city has been really a, a bellwether for some intentional land conservation. And now there's a, a almost a ring around San Marcos um, that of 18 miles of protected lands, and it's remarkable and it's fantastic and it's a great asset for that community. And so for that, from that, uh, Deborah Moran and, um, and some others formed the Great Springs Project and then 
hired me and we built a team and, and moved from plan, from an envision in the organization, just the vision of, of a, a connected trail plus land conservation into planning it and then actual execution and transactions. And just to give a little perspective, when we talk about the recharge zone of the Edwards Aquifer between San Antonio and Austin, that's a, an area that's maybe 90 miles north-south or all of southwest to northeast in the graphic there. And then maybe it's 30 miles wide, roughly. So around 500,000 acres in that area. Of that, when we started the, the work, just over 50,000 acres was already in conservation in some way. Great conservation organizations working there along with, along with and, and you absolutely have to um, hold this up. The work of private landowners in doing conservation is, is amazing in this state. It is incredible. And there's been great conservation work done in this area. So when we say we want to add another 50,000 acres, um, we're talking about less than 10% of the available land in this corridor. Right. And so there's intentionality, but there's also perspective. Right. It's interesting, too, is that in thinking to, you know, on those days when I feel good and I make it really far into the green belt, I can I know that I'm able to find one flowing spring that is still, you know, is guaranteed to still be, you know, coming out of the rocks. And and uh, and, and given the fact that we had been. Uh, until just recently, I mean, we we got some rain recently when I was uh, traveling out of the country. But yeah, we'd been in a, in a pretty dry period, and pretty much there is no water in the creek, and that's the like the only spot I know that there's going to be some water, you know, kind of trickling out of there. And from that, life happens. There's like there's fish in there. There's birds that are attracted to that area. Talk a little bit about that part of this in terms of that connection of the health of the aquifer, the health of the land, the health of the springs uh, and and climate. So this this part of Texas is amazing and the Edwards Aquifer particularly is incredible um, for it being an area that has very unique species, um, in some cases indigenous only to the Edwards Aquifer and the areas around it. You think of um, aquatic species that only live in the Edwards Aquifer, or not aquatic species like golden cheek warbler, for example, that, um, that lives in this area. And, and so the work of doing conservation through public agencies like cities or counties, think about um, habitat conservation plans that they would do or watershed protection plans that cities or counties or river authorities would do. You think about the work of private landowners to move land into conservation, particularly on the surface here around Golden Cheek Warbler Habitat, and then the work of the Edwards Aqua Authority and, and the other river authorities um, like GBRA and El- uh, Guadalupe Blanco River Authority and uh, San Antonio River Authority and the Lower Colorado River Authority around species protection. There, are, There's a lot at play around the relationship and the protection of habitat that relates to water conservation and, and water resource protection that kind of underlies our mission at Great Springs Project. I also notice on on this slide here, uh, you know, basically a, a nod to you know the historical context of of this area. Why don't you speak to this just a little bit? We understand that we are among the current stewards of the idea of the connection of these four springs and the relationship to humans. What you're looking at there in this slide kind of in the middle, that's the a portion of the white shaman rock art panel. Uh, this is along the, the Pecos River near the confluence with the Rio Grande. And it shows what s- some people believe and we believe to be these four springs connected. Uh, that panel um, ranges in age from 4,000 to 2,500 years old. And it's actually part of a, of, of a massive uh, rock art panel the communities that you're looking at there in the map on the right side, they were built in those uh, in particular locations because of the access to water from the springs, from San Antonio when George Brackenridge, you know, started his his built his house there on the in, on the headwaters of the San Antonio River, to the, the city of New Braunfels built around Comal Springs and and on and on. So, what we believe now 
the work that we do is reflective of the work that's been done for millennia. Uh, and it represents what people really fundamentally understand, which is we, we do not exist as a people without being connected to and protective of our water resources. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I think about when, when I think about these, these challenges that, and, and the tensions that exist here in this arena, in this area is trying to encourage a vision of, of like a different land use pattern and, and plan. And we've been struggling here in the city of Austin to, to rewrite our land use code and, and to be able to uh, really encourage there to be, uh, you know, more people within walking and biking distance, uh, you know, to meaningful destinations and being able to hopefully take a little bit of that pressure off of that continuous sprawl of, of, you know, housing trying to, you know, gobble up more and more of this precious land that we're, that we're trying to conserve here. Talk, talk a little bit about that and, and where, you know, I, I know it's probably not core to your, your mission, but it's certainly adjacent to it. Absolutely. And in Texas, and, and particularly in these rapidly developing areas of Texas, the Hill Country and Central Texas, the, the fact that there is so little publicly accessible um, open space just resonates through so many of the decisions that get made. So for us, adding more parks and open space and, and trails is responsive to what people are asking for. When city parks and recs departments do surveys or cities do surveys and they ask people what, what do they want in their town, invariably more parks and more trails is at the very, very tops of those lists. So, so people are wanting these places to be outside. Uh, we saw that uh, through the uh, pandemic as we did safe streets to give people more places to be outside. We see that in our great Texas state park systems where um, there's just so much uh, engagement and so much use. We see lines like an enchanted rock going down the highway to get in there and reservation systems, which are necessary now because people um, are just, it's just challenging to find these great places to be outside. And so adding more parks and open space is uh, important for quality of life, for the reasons that we want to live in the hill country. We want to live in central Texas. It's to enjoy, just like you get to enjoy the green belt in Austin because it's close to your house. We need to have these places close at hand for people. We have in our corridor, I drive up and down and I talk with and work with people in every community. And we have people from one community where there are not enough parks and trails and they have to get in their car and they drive on I-35 15, 20, or 30 minutes to get to the next town so that they can go to a park or be on a trail. And when they finish that, then they get back in their car and they have to drive back to their home. We think that by working together, by listening at a local level, finding those opportunities for more parks and trails in their own community, we're making those communities better and stronger. Yeah, that's that's one of my biggest pet peeves is uh, that pressure to you know be out having to feel like you have to get into a car to be able to go to a park and and then that puts pressure on the park area and the trailheads to have uh, massive amounts of parking uh, it's just this you know, it's a very very unsustainable um, cycle and I've had uh, the opportunity to have um, a representative from the trust for public land you know, on the podcast before. And we talked a little bit about the 10 minute walk campaign of being able to ensure that there is a, a park or a trail uh, or, or, you know, a linear park or something like that within a 10 minute walk of everybody, you know, within a, a community. And I think that's an incredible uh, and important factor. Um, but I wanted to pull up this slide because I think that it's something that a lot of people don't appreciate is that trails in all shapes and forms, pathways and trails whether they're paved or unpaved are in fact drivers of uh, economic benefit talk a little bit about this uh, from from your perspective yeah this is really important to our conversation with all of the communities and constituencies in our project area from for me i have a background in local government and i understand if you're asking uh, for 
public financial support or our public investment in a project, it's important to talk about the rate of return of, of using those public funds. No different from if you if you were asking for an investment on the private side, you have to you have to explain and, and have um, a, a, right, a rate of return for that for to, to receive certain in, uh, investment. So the 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 economic impact, the business growth, we've got economic impact uh, studies that um, reflect the value economic impact of this trail. We can point to the economic impact of other regional trails like uh, the Razorback Greenway in Northwest Arkansas is a great example of um, a one-time $30 million investment with some additional investments along the way that's had outsized economic impact for those communities. This, the same, we could have the same conversation about other trails, regional trails around the country and the economic impact that, we, that they have. But then thinking about it on a very, very local level, not just bringing more people in to visit your, your community and then leaving, the, the impact that they have with, with your, your local businesses to attract new businesses, to um, attract and retain employees, to provide those, that great community feel that makes people want to stay in a community and engage and work in that community and spend their money in that community. And then just the value uh, to us as a state and to our economy of protecting the water in the aquifer having these open spaces and all the economic benefits that flow from that, from flood mitigation to water quality protection to habitat protection for species. Trails, parks, and open space are the lowest cost, highest rate of return infrastructure that you can build from a local government perspective. Yeah, yeah. And again, that goes back to, you know, working, doing what we can on our, our land use pattern too, to, to be able to have, you know, more people being able to be able to access that and, and try to conserve and, and preserve that land so that we don't have that, that same pressure that continually goes there. So this is interesting. So you've got some numbers that you put together mm-hmm. for a, a total annual benefit. Walk us through what's going on here. Sure. So I, I, I know that a, a trail guy talking about um, rates of return sounds wonky, but the, the reality is is that there are all kinds of priorities priorities that are out there for, and and without uh, money toward projects, all you have is a, is a vision. So someone someone smarter than I am has has said that conservation without money is just conversation, right? right. No money, no mission. And so this is an important part of it is, is how, how does your project, how does a trail project, how does a park and open space project rise in priority with all the other priorities that cities have from a trans, you know, transportation and, um, and public safety and physical health, like all the things that cities need to spend money on or counties need to spend money on or private investment needs to spend money on. Why is your project important? And so t- part of the way we make that case is by talking about these things that aren't at the front of the mind. So this slide represents um, that we, at the beginning, on the idea of a 100-mile trail in this corridor, what would be the economic impact of that trail? So just under $56 million per year, just in those four categories that are listed there. Um, so the economic uh, line is uh, increased hotel occupancy taxes and sales taxes, people coming to visit. The land and water uh, is somewhat of the value of, of some water quality protection, but it does not um, it, that does not include the value of water in place in the aquifer. Transportation, because there are going to be some transportation savings in this, particularly in the urban areas, we work on connected networks of trails and developing trail segments that can be used uh, for active transportation to get from your house to a, uh, to a school or from your home to, to the local grocery store and, and, and back. And, and so fewer car rides does lead to some transportation savings and then health, just the, the physical health benefits and the mental health benefits of more access to parks and open space and trails is very significant. Again, this was on the idea of a hundred mile trail. We're gonna be working on this um, and looking at it more closely now that we have the actual alignments, proposed alignments for the trail segments. And, um, and I, I expect that we'll have also some better data sets and that this number will change dramatically when we look at it more closely. Yeah, man. Well, you're talking my uh, my language here with yeah. the, uh, active transportation <laughs> and health. That's that's fantastic. What's our biggest challenge in in seeing this thing through? 
what, before I said yes to Great Springs Project, I thought the biggest challenge would be to actually find the alignments where you could build the trail for 100 plus miles in the middle of two of the most rapidly developing com counties in the United States and two anchor cities that are growing at a massive rate, San Antonio and Austin. But once we figured out we could, we could find the alignments, then the next challenge was, can you, can you build a coalition? Uh, that it's going to take to get this done. And and you have to, we, we thought about that and we, we realized that this this has to be about everyone. It really has to be a place for everyone in this. And, and it becomes just a big Texas-sized project, a lot of ways to say yes to it. So that wasn't the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge we face right now is that there is just not many places in Texas where people can experience the relationship of private property and public access in ways that benefit the private property. So we believe very, very strongly in private property rights. And one of the things that we believe in is by connecting private property to public access, it can make your private property better, stronger, more marketable, more valuable, more usable. That's, but because people don't have that experience in Texas because we have so little publicly accessible space, it's just a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with private landowners, listening to their questions and, and understanding their concerns, and then helping them to see uh, the opportunity that would come to them with this kind of a transaction. Um, I'm encouraged by it. I'll say that. I'm very encouraged by it. As a Texan, I'm really encouraged by it. But... It takes time and, and it takes a lot of, of individual conversations. Right. And I imagine funding is is a, another part of it. So we'll pull up the funding uh, slide because I know that most of the audience is going, yeah, but where are you going to get the money? Right. <laughs> yeah. So the money. Um, the, so what you're looking at on the slide here are the sources of funds for the, the public side of the investment. And we really look at three buckets. We look at public funds like these that can come about in a variety of ways. So for every one of our projects, we'll be working with a project partner, again, whether it's a city or a county or even a private landowner to see if there's some public funds that can help be contributed toward the project. Another bucket of money though is, um, is private investment. So if there's uh, an opportunity to either do um, a small amount of development on a piece of property working with that landowner supporting the work that that landowner is doing or um, transitioning the ownership of that property to a private investor that will undertake those kind of activities that do primarily conservation and generally trail and, and then a potential for some development, which can mean a lot of different things. It can mean open space development, turning a, a large ranch into smaller but open space ranches, or it could be a small commercial development, even a small residential development with significant conservation. And then the third bucket of money is is just the public support piece, uh, philanthropy in all of its forms, because this is a big project that's transformative for Texas. We do not have anything like this in Texas um, where we don't have right of way. This, this is not a, a, a rails to trails project. We're out there building a giant coalition and, and then working together to, to connect the trail. Yeah, yeah. It, you do have a, a, a really cool slide in here that says that it only takes 25 uh, feet to make a park. So I got to pull this up because I, <laughs> I, I just had a chuckle of, about it, you know. Yeah. It, it, in other words, it, it, it doesn't have to be that grand necessarily. And, and, we, and, and, and you had mentioned it earlier is that there are some urban sections of this trail project that are actually paved trails mm -hmm. yes there's some that are in the wilderness uh like the one that i run on but there's plenty of it that is also this and you mentioned it earlier is that leveraging the opportunity of an all ages and abilities active mobility uh and and that's one of the key drivers that really helps uh, maximize the return on investment when you look at a, a pathway or a trail yeah, we, we work uh, to be as creative as possible on just how to include more parks, open space, and trail inventory 
into our geographic footprint. I, we have people that are on the ground looking at places like this one you see on the screen. They may be looking at um, culverts to go, they go under highways and uh, there are possible connections that can happen there. Um, we have a couple of rail lines that cross over um, sections. We look at creekways. We look at all the potential um, ways that a uh, trail can be connected, but also you can develop more parks and open space, whether it's um, like a homeowners association that ended up with some uh, property and floodways, for example. That property may have water quality um, protection characteristics. And so finding ways to manage that property for those conservation benefits is important. And it's something that you really only find out about. You can see it on a map, but you've got to see it in person. And I'll say that's one of the things that we work really hard on is being on site and, and knowing the pieces, the particular pieces of property along the way. We spend a lot of time on the land and trying to understand it and, um, and think about how we and all of our project partners can help to contribute to the protection of that land or the connectivity of those trail segments. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up uh, your most recent newsletter from uh, September and uh, right off the bat, <laughs> you know, really, you know, honing in on that this is your mission. What you're trying to do now is to put land into conservation and get trail on the ground and talking about this particular um, recent acquisition. And so this really emphasizes the fact that in many cases, in many opportunities, your pulling together the funds, you're leveraging funds, you're doing whatever you can to actually get land into conservation. For people who don't really understand what we're talking about here, can, can you kind of like, you know, in, in non like legalese and non real estate jargon, can you kind of just walk us through what you're buying up land and doing what with it? <laughs> okay, I'll do that, John. Do you have a buzzer? So if I if I fall into <laughs> <by> say, <laughs> anything in Latin, just to yeah. just bother me, okay. So the, the paragraph of that, um, putting land and conservation trail on the ground. Um, I, I say that that that's our that's. The strategic plan for Grace Springs Project has two lines, two sentences, and those are the only two, put land in conservation, put trail on the ground. I and mean, that's what right. we exist for. Yeah. But, but the how to do it part, this Presa Grande prop, uh, project is, is really a great example of that. So we, it's, we call it Presa Grande, the, this property Presa Grande, because there's a very large flood control dam on it. And there's a series of dams that were built by the Army Corps of Engineers in, uh, a number of years ago along in the Sink Creek area, just west of San Marcos, um, and okay. several branches of Sink Creek that um, really um, catch a lot of water and then push water straight toward the city of, of San Marcos, Spring Lake, the springs themselves, um, and then ultimately into the, the San Marcos River. So this property had been 844 acres. It had been for sale um, at various times over the years. It had been under contract to be purchased a couple of different times because of its proximity to the city of San Marcos and that it is, um, has um, some open space, some flat space, very developable land, and two branches of Sink Creek on it, it's really been looked at by real estate developers for a subdivision. And it has a lot of, there's a lot of development around it. A lot of single family house houses have been built right around this property. After I came on board and we looked at it again, it, it was under contract to be purchased by a developer and that deal fell through. And so we were in the wings, and as soon as it did, um, we made an offer, we Great Springs Project made an offer to buy the property, and, and that offer was accepted. And, and so then we started to work on how to build the, the financing around that project to move it into conservation. Okay. So we found um, some people that wanted to invest in the property, and they wanted to own the property themselves um, for recreational purposes, which was great. And they wanted to keep it mainly whole, and, and use it um, for a, a hunting operation and a, a weekend ranch for themselves and their families, which is perfect for a property like this. Okay. So we worked with them on, um, on an agreement on their behalf to the vast majority of that property, put a conservation easement over the vast majority of that property, to donate a trail easement on two sides of that property to Hayes County um, in exchange for Hayes County providing funding for the conservation easement. We worked with the Edwards Aqua Authority to provide some funding to, to be able to do some 
some research on the property in exchange for money that was used for fencing. And then there's one a small portion of that property along um, a roadway that really doesn't have many conservation features on it. It really was better suited for uh, single family houses. And so worked with the investors to develop 10, 10 acre lots to be home sites to help to subsidize the cost of buying the property and, and moving it into conservation. There's a phase two of that that will involve the city of San Marcos, we hope, and to acquire another piece of it for conservation. But that really is reflective of, for us, um, bringing a, quite a few different groups together with the common goal of conservation and, and a recreation opportunity for trails, and then making the financing part of it work for everyone. So now the landowner's happy, Hayes County has trail easements, we're gonna help with that um, on getting the trail built. A really important part of a chunk of Sink Creek is protect um, instead of 600 homes, it will have 10 homes on it. Um, and that those 10 homes are nowhere close to um, any kind of conservation uh, resources. Fantastic. And I see here that uh, one of your trail planners, uh, Kenny, is, is working on uh, getting out there and hiking in through here and flagging it out and, and trying to figure out where uh, the trail should go. Will this be a natural surface trail or a paved trail? This one, um, it, um, it's going to be primarily natural surface trail. Um, okay. It really is well suited for that. There are a couple of um, you know, topographical features that are going to need some something that's a little more hardy, a little more burly to get up and down um, some small yeah. features, um, but it'll be natural soft top trail the rest of it. Okay, very good. And I, I see here that there's an opportunity to actually for the community to, to donate um, to help towards uh, the trail hit. What, what's what's kind of happening here? Yeah, this was another really interesting feature of this property that um, a number of years ago, the one of the roads that it, passes right in front of the property had been slightly relocated. Um, and as a result, there are right around three acres right on the corner of this property um, that make a perfect trailhead. And it's sort of an orphan piece of property uh, yeah. that's surrounded by other places. And so again, with Hayes County and with some funders to develop that is the perfect trailhead right on the corner of the property. Then from there be, to be able to get on the trail and then move around, move around the property. So that we're generating support from that, from the public. We, we have some foundational support for that as well. And then, um, and we'll continue to help to develop that um, because it's, it's, we're super happy to have the land in conservation. And we're super happy to have the trail easement. And what we really want is to have a trail built that people can use. So we'll right. continue to work on it <laughs> to get a trail on the ground that people can use. And hopefully one that people don't have to drive to, to that, be able to use it as well. That, that is right. And to that end, let me, let me say that as once we, we didn't know this was happening until it was happening, but once that project was moving forward, a, a couple of the neighbors came forward with some opportunities of our own. And so there's a strong potential to connect that trail on that Presa Grande property to other trail, to other trail, and then eventually into the city of San Marcos's public trail system, which would be yeah. remarkable. Yeah. So uh, as I alluded to, I, I, I just got back from uh, some international travel. I was in uh, uh, the Netherlands as well as uh, spent a little bit of time in Belgium and a little bit of time in France, in, in Paris. But one of the things that I love so much about uh, traveling in the Netherlands is the ability to um, very easily on my bike, just be able to get on a, a pathway and uh, uh really quite quickly be out into the rural countryside and they have just this fantastic network of trails uh you know connecting village to village city to city and so i had to think of you i was just like you know it's like i mean it, this is this is kind of what this is um but one of the things that I noted is, and, and I grew up on a ranch in Northern California, so I understand the, the rural context and, and ranch land and, and, and things of that nature. But when I'm on my bike and I'm rolling past, you know, uh, all of these wonderful farms uh, there in the Dutch countryside, and I'm just thinking, this is so cool that, you know, these easements have been, you know, created and uh and they're facilitating you know active mobility and it was it's just so cool because especially with 
the uh, proliferation of electric assist, we're seeing older and older and older people uh, continuing to remain active. They're getting out on their electric assist bikes and they're in their you know, 70s and 80s and 90s. And it's so incredible to see because they're just soaking up that rural environment that, you know, nature. So I thought about you. <laughs> yeah, hey, well, thanks for that, Don. I, I, you know, that's one of the things I, I, I really do wish that more people would would be would have the opportunity to see what the opportunities are to be in places like that where there there has been the right of way secured and the trail built and people can use it all people can use it for whatever they want to use it for and you see those places where those trails are so well used and so well loved and so much just an integral part of people's daily lives and we we should have that in texas we can have that in texas and we're working really hard to bring that to texas I get the sense that it, what you're doing here in this project could be duplicated many times over throughout Texas if if we can just kind of work through uh, any challenges and any tensions that that sort of exist of that public and private you know use or it's really public use of of you know pub, private land and or private adjacent land. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the for us. Um, this Austin to San Antonio uh, trail network, we really are looking at it as a spine. And um, we have been talking with um, people that are working on trails and thinking about how to connect their trails to, to this trail from Bernie and Kendall County to Seguin, um, east and west and north and south of this Austin to San Antonio corridor. Um, and then you look at some other regional trails that um, are either happening or have been contemplated around Texas. And, um, and, and there's great potential uh, if we can continue this work and, and, can, uh, and, and, and find some transformational changes to the way we think about trails and public, uh, this kind of active transportation component, and then find the funding for it and continue to prioritize it the way we have been. Um, we may look up in a few years and, uh, and just see a remarkable change in, in this state for the better for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that some segments of the trail are in place. Where are we at in terms of number of miles and percentages and that sort of thing? The, the way that we develop the alignments for the trail itself, um, with this steering committee of people that were already involved in building trails in their community and, and in their county, was by looking at, at all of the plants that we could find that had trail in them in some way. So city, um, parks and, and, and open space plans and trails plans and transportation plans, long-term transportation plans, thoroughfare plans, everything that, um, and even talking with the real estate developers themselves that are doing master plan communities and looking at their development agreements to see where they had trails and parks. So through those, we sifted through all those with the steering committee and, um, and figured out, okay, this plan is really happening and, and this one is never going to happen. And part of this one will and not. So through that, we were we really worked to use the things that were already being um, promoted and, and worked on locally. Then we found the, the gaps, and the gaps are something that we at Great Springs Project are taking on, finding those ways to connect. So when you look at our trail plan that's on our website that this past April, you'll see the maps that actually show the alignments, and it will reference the particular plan that it comes from. So you can see the city of New Braunfels may have a, a dry comb out creek plan. San Marcos has their plan. So to answer your question better, of the 100 plus miles of the trail network, over a third of that is already on the ground with just the trails that are being, being built. And looking at projects that are on the short term time horizon um, from transportation plans and these park plans, there's roughly another third of it that is right away is either secured or being secured to do it. And so that leaves about a third of it for us to be out doing our land conservation projects and our trail right away acquisition project to secure that right away to connect all those things. I love it. Our timeline is we say the Alamo to the Capitol by 2036. Okay. Um, but, but, but we really want to get it done sooner. Right. So cool. So cool. Gary, it's been such an honor and pleasure uh, chatting with you. Is there any final nugget you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, John, I, I want to say again, thank you so much for having, it, it's really a great opportunity to talk about our work, but also really enjoy hearing your perspective on the project, 
what I'll ask you and ask anyone is, um, if you think that there's something that we're, um, we can do better, there's, uh, if you have an idea, um, if, if there's something you'd like to do to help, this is a big collaborative project. And so please reach out to us. Um, you can look at our website and there's a contact tab there. You can sign up for our newsletter at greatestspringsproject.org. We do have social media, follow that. Um, but please engage with us because um, we there's, a, there's room in this project for everyone. And it's gonna take all of us, all of us working together to make this happen the way that it should. Fantastic, yeah, and I'm gonna pull back just a little bit so everyone can see that website again. Again, that is greatspringsproject.org. Gary Merritt, thank you so very much uh, for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you, John. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Gary Merritt. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and be sure to ring the notifications bell next to the subscription button so you can customize your notification preferences. And also, if you are enjoying this content, I'd be honored to have you become an Active Towns ambassador. Uh, it's super, super easy. You can buy me a coffee. Uh, you can become a patron on our Patreon account. Uh, it's all available at activetowns.org. The website, just go there. Um, also, there's a tab for the Active Towns store, so you can pick up your own Streets of Free People swag there. Uh, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Hey, also want to send a very special thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors uh, out there who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, uh, Buy Me A Coffee, the YouTube Super Thanks, uh, as well as purchases from the Active Town store and making donations to the nonprofit. Uh, I simply could not do this without you. So again, thank you so very much.